<laughs> Hello, welcome. This is Andrea Miller, the host of Open Relationships Transforming Together, joined by my co-host Joanna Schroeder and amazing producer Brian Atkins. We have an extraordinary, an extraordinary guest on our show today. Her name is Lane Beachley. Uh, stand by for just two seconds um, for her amazing introduction. Uh, but before we get there, just a quick shout out in terms of why we're doing this show. Why open relationships? People are like, what's that about, right? Um, we do go, we go interesting places. We do. <laughs> but we're really here to help you understand what it feels and looks like to open up emotionally. There is a loneliness epidemic, a mental health crisis, a relationship crisis raging across much of the globe. So many of us just don't freaking know how to talk to each other anymore. What we do really well is this. So we are here. And if you couldn't see that, you're like, what is happening? Because you're listening on Spotify or I was just puking on my phone. Um, in all sincerity, I know a lot of people feel like, oh, I really prioritize my relationships, but the data shows otherwise. Relationships are a need to have, not a nice to have. The quality of our lives is predicated on the quality of our relationships. So it is high stakes, folks. And that is why we are here to do the show. And we're so glad you're listening. Um, and now let me introduce our amazing guest. Uh, Lane Beachley is a surfing legend. She has epically claimed seven world titles, five won in a state of fear, two in a state of love. And we're going to come back to that. Uh, she is one of the greatest surfers of all time. I mean, seriously badass, including the only surfer in history, male or female, to win six consecutive world titles. Lane's path to success was peppered with many challenges, including adoption, mental illness, life-threatening injuries, and overcoming failures. Lane is not only a champion in surfing, but also a fierce advocate for equality within the sport, a passionate environmental campaigner and philanthropist, chair of Surfing Australia, and champion for mental wellness. Today, as a founder of Awake Academy, her mission is to empower one million people to become more centered, connected, and confident. Lane still surfs every day, loves rosé, and her greatest weakness is hot chips. Yay! Welcome, Lane. <laughs> <laughs> and there's always more. I mean, we, we summarized it. Holy smokes. <laughs> the most important question is, are hot chips like french fries here? Or yes. are you using like oh. spicy corn chips? Okay, okay. No, so I had a feeling fries. we were misunderstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking spicy. I'm thinking like, yeah. uh, what are like those? Like hot Cheetos. Yeah, like, yeah, no, hot Cheetos no, or no. like Fuego uh, Takis. Uh, how do oh, I? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm all about yes. the hot potato. Oh, oh hot yeah, potato. me too. Oh, hot God, I love fried a potato. French fry. Oh, the fries are best. Yeah, I can, I, I, it's my greatest weakness. <laughs> it's like my kryptonite. And do you eat it with mayonnaise or ketchup? Like, what do you do ketchup. down there? I don't know okay. a bit of aioli, but ketchup. But you know what? They call it hot chips in Australia. French fries in America, but they call it hot chips for a reason. You can't eat them lukewarm. You can't eat them oh. cold. They no. have to be hot. That is okay, true. We've got the most important thing out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> We're here in, yeah, in, uh, in, in just, you know, incredible agreement. Okay. I may or may not be asking for a friend. What's the deal with sharks? Rumor has that they <laughs> swim in the sharkiest places. And anytime we go to the beach, my kids are like, are there sharks here? I'm like, no. I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> well, how do you know? Yeah. There's sharks everywhere. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that, it's their playground. We're just entering it. It's like when you're walking into a home of a stranger. It's a stranger's playground, and you've just got to be respectful of the space that you're in. So with sharks, look, they're, um, we know they're out there. Ideally, we have to believe that the oceans have enough food in them for the sharks. We've done a great job of culling as many sharks as we possibly can, which they are an apex predator. So they keep not only our oceans, but also the ecosystems that live within them in a healthy balance. So by taking mm -hmm. the apex predator out of that, we're actually creating a very unbalanced or imbalanced world, both within the oceans and outside of it. The oceans provide 50% of our oxygen. So we need sharks and um, they're our friends, just like Bruce in Finding Nemo. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not, oh, right. Oh, gosh. Good shout out to Bruce. Oh, yeah. and I like that there's a good tip in there for you well, when you're talking to your kids, Andrew, which is we believe there's enough food for the sharks in the ocean that they're not actually interested in us. Yes, exactly. And they've, it's been proven that they don't like the taste of human blood. But the problem that we have is that sharks can't, they don't, 
have uh, taste buds on their tongues <laughs> like we do. So if we want to taste something, we just put it in our mouth. Their taste buds are on their gums, which reside underneath their, th their teeth. So they actually have to bite something <laughs> to determine whether it's edible or not. That is not reassuring. <laughs> that is not. Yeah. Okay. That beach trip, uh, we're going to the mountains. Forget it. <laughs> but I will tell you, and I've told this to Andrea before when she asked me, uh, Lane knows my husband, Yvonne, and and he always told the kids like, oh, there's no sh there's no sharks at this break. There's no sharks at this beach. Like they're, <laughs> they're out there. They're way far. They're looking for seals. There's no seals here. And then one time we went to a beach and there were like loads of seals. And the kids were like, we know what this means. Lots of seals <laughs> equals lots of sharks. Well, also so I eat like, lots of food for the sharks. Yeah. Ooh, good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, also, sharks are natural predators, so they won't let you see them. So if you see a shark, it's actually okay because they want they don't want to be seen. If they want okay, to eat you, they'll come from the deep de depths of the ocean and just come up and eat you anyway. So if it just, this you is... know, it's coming around, I just be curious. They are naturally curious. They're beautiful. Uh, you yeah. just have to learn to respect them. And here's one thing. Um what we fear, we attract. So if you have a fear of sharks, then you've got a good chance of attracting a shark. So just mm -hmm. uh, recognize your fear and acknowledge that it's a fear that's not real because you can't control it. It's outside of you. So the only thing you can control is within you and how you respond to that emotion that's actually just energy passing through you. Well, that's a great segue um, mm -hmm. to a, a, a bit more of a serious question. You're a, a passionate champion for people to be their most authentic selves, which can be mm -hmm. freaking scary, right? <laughs> What's the most difficult thing you've had to confront to own your own truth as you teach that? Self-worth. You know, we've grown up at a time where our sense of self and identity and worth has been dictated to us by external factors, but the way out is always within. So if we have the ability and the courage to look in the mirror and own who we are and reassure ourselves with self-love and self-compassion, then we'll be in a much more loving, more compassionate, empathetic world. But right now we're so distracted. Our perceptions are so distorted. Uh, our lives are so, they're under attack by like so many distractions and, and um and external validations and, and it's just uh, having a, a toxic impact on, on our quality of lives. So I think the biggest challenge I had to overcome within my professional surfing career and now in my professional speaking career is is that sense of self-worth and not allowing external circumstances to dictate that to me. Amen. That's something that I can completely relate to. I, I've personally spoken a lot about this. And oh, yeah? I'm curious, what, what, was, what was it like to be Little Lane? And were there things you did to adapt? I, I talk openly, as does Joanna, about coming from um, a lot of alcoholism and addiction. Mm. And it's like, okay, that is not available to me. <laughs> that is a very bad yeah. idea. And, you know, deadly eating disorders. Well, that's a bad idea. I'm not doing that. Right. So mm. for me, I picked what the virtuous route of, of external validation, workaholism. Right. And it's, uh -huh. oh, you get so much praise for working hard. So I'm curious for you. Mm -hmm. What did you do to compensate as you were younger and didn't didn't have the wisdom that you have now? I was a victim, so I was very quick to blame mm -hmm. everybody else for my disappointments and dissatisfactions and failures in life. I was really harsh and brash. I was very quick to judge and criticize. Similar to you, maybe I just wholeheartedly invested myself in training and surfing and becoming the best in the world at something. So at least I was able to channel it towards something positive, but at what cost? And you had to freaking me... prove yourself, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. The, the two sides of that sword, we, you know, we overachievers know all too well. Yeah. And I drank a lot as well. And uh, I wouldn't call it alcoholism, <laughs> but I would call it uh, alcohol abuse. You know? yeah. And it was um, yeah. any form of numbing. And we're always running from something. We've never really been taught to just sit in discomfort and lean into discomfort and accept it as a natural part of our journey or our lives. It's a process that we have to learn to go through. And if we learn how to endure discomfort without judgment and criticism of it and have more empathy around it, then it'll go past us. But because we connect with it, we identify with our bodies and we identify with things we don't like and anything we don't like, we judge, we criticize, we ridicule, we place it out there. We go, I'm not going to be that. And then we become that because we're focusing on what we don't want to become. Then we spend more time trying not to be something. So then we're sabotaging our authentic selves to be something that we're not. 
and that becomes a vicious cycle. It's amazing how much work we put into and the blame. I mean, I relate to the blame thing. It's amazing how much work we put into trying to protect ourselves from these truths. And so it's it's this really, to me, insidious form of self-sabotage. Yes. And because the truth is so scary and painful. Um, Only if you how, judge it that way. Well, totally. And that's, I mean, that to me is when you cross the Rubicon and you go, holy crap, this is what it's like to be free. Right. But yeah, it ta- I feel yeah. like it takes a lot of priming or I don't know why. It just takes you know, acceptance. For sure. mm-hmm. It just takes acceptance. You know, acceptance is the ending of all suffering, but we'd rather suffer than accept. You know, we'd rather suffer in our pain and misery and disappointments and, and judgments because it's a sense of control. It's a locus of control. We, the illusion that if we if we just keep everything out there, then we don't have to look in here. And that's the uh-huh. nature of perfectionism. You know, you walk into a house that's really specifically, you know, got a whole lot of OCD and perfectionism. That's just a reflection that everything in there is fucked up. Math. Yeah. <laughs> it's mess. Yeah. Because oh. as long as everything out there is okay, then I don't have to look within. I don't have to deal with the shit that's going on inside. Me. I'm feeling so much better about my messy office and oh, the mail that's too. piled around me now. Lane, thank you. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I was, I'm like, just going to own this now. This is this is the best thing. Next time you're in LA, you come over and see my messy, messy house. Gonna, yeah, you must be so, you know, <laughs> internally uh, organized. Um, let, let me <laughs> yeah, to this. It. Well, then oh. the challenge is with the messy office also. If it's a space that you spend a lot of time in, <laughs> that can also be a reflection of your mind. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, there's there's, there's balances there's that both. you have to find. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But let me ask this, because when I think about so <laughs> many people, <laughs> I, one of my favorite phrases, everybody wants to transform, nobody wants to change. How do you approach people or, or when people approach you through Awake Academy, through your incredible work, yeah. and they just, it's like, it's so hard for them to accept that truth, but that same truth will set them free. What's that dynamic like? What do you say to them? I used to be the kind of person that liked to tell people how to do it. And mm-hmm. then I realized you can't make someone do something that they're not ready to do. Mm-hmm. It comes down to that state of dis I call it dissatisfaction like I'm dissatisfied with how I feel now I'm willing to do something and that comes from my own personal experiences with depression and mental health issues you know I wasn't willing to reach out and ask for help until I felt so dissatisfied or so scared or so fearful it's like okay I'm too uncomfortable now and I know I don't have the resources to deal with this myself I'm gonna have to ask for help and when I did the first person I called she literally picked up the phone I went hi Lane I said hi Joe she's like what took you so long because oh. the people around us know what we're going through more so than we know ourselves. You know? And that's when you've got to have that dream team. So when I'm dealing with people at Awake Academy and I'm helping people through their challenges and their stories and their issues, I just hold the space for them. Mm-hmm. And that's what women beautifully do. You know, we're natural nurturers. We hold the mm-hmm. space. But that means also leaning into the discomfort of their discomfort and not taking on their pain. Now, people who are parents want to protect their children because your child's pain becomes your pain. So you don't want to see your child in a state of pain or unhappiness because it makes you feel the pain and unhappiness too. But if you can somewhat disassociate, not disassociate, but just detach yourself and hold the space for them to process that pain, then it's their pain. It's not your pain. It's their suffering. It's not your suffering. It's their sadness, not your sadness. You're just holding the space and creating a safe environment for them to process it. So at Awake Academy, it's self-paced. You can do it at your own time. And a lot of people buy the course and don't do it because they're like, okay, I'm halfway there. They took the step. Maybe that's part of it is just being like, I recognize I need to do a thing. Yeah. A lot of what you're saying reminds me of when I was dealing with panic disorder when I was like 20 and it was really serious. Like I was debilitated by it. And I remember a therapist broke through and changed everything for me when she said, you can't fight it. The panic is going to happen. You don't have any control over it. Accept it and ride it like a wave. And when and then tell yourself it's not forever. Mm -hmm. And there are like a million different times when I use that now where it's like whether I'm mad at my husband or my kids are being insane or whatever it is, I'll be like, this isn't forever. I'm just going to feel this. Because it's that moment, and and with panic disorder, anyone who's ever had a panic attack, the more you go, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't, it gets worse and worse and worse. And then when (laughs) you go, this is panic, it's not forever, it's going to be done. Then all of a sudden, 
But yeah, a little, little bit of a uh, little practical Buddhism there, right? Just to, oh, yeah. to be a bit detached. But I want to loop back to, you just gave a great unpopular opinion that I'm going to verbalize as, fo- as follows. I think so many of us parents, especially as moms, we believe we are only as happy as our Fear. unhappiest child. And I feel like you just shattered that. And in a way, I love it because it just makes me feel like it is such a gift when I have the wisdom, when my kids are freaking out or upset, to meet them where they are, right? And, mm. and be, you said, empathetic for sure, but to not take that on and not react. Like, to me, that ability to notice and give them that, that, that like you said, don't even tell, show that that's that they're, this is okay, right? And so often we don't want our kids to hurt, you know, or anybody, but especially our kids, we don't want them to hurt. We don't want them to feel rejected. So we try to make it okay. And it just feels like that instinct is is actually probably fairly toxic a lot of the time. Yeah. So I like that you just so said that. how that unfair thing. to your other kids that mm-hmm. if one is really struggling, you can't be happy with the other one. Yeah. That's a really yeah. unhealthy paradigm. Yeah, hundred percent. And the thing is that we go into drama. So, res- taking responsibility doesn't mean you're taking ownership. It means you're you're investing in the ability to respond to the situation. Yeah. If you're not taking responsibility, you are back into a reactionary mindset. And when the minute you're in a reactionary mindset, you are now in the state of drama. And drama is literally a triangle. So at the top of the triangle is you're that you identify someone as a victim Mm -hmm. and once you've identified someone as a victim you will now go into rescue mode you will try and fix them rescue them change Mm -hmm. the situation and the minute you do that you become persecuted by it so they'll even attack you or persecute you and then you'll stay in that cycle because now you're going to try and now you'll see yourself as the victim and now you're going to overcompensate for it and try and fix that and try and change that and not own that so (laughs) The drama triangle with being a victim and a rescuer and then being persecuted keeps us stuck in this really, as Joe said, a really unhealthy paradigm. It's a a toxic cycle. The way to get out of that is to stop seeing anyone as a victim and start listening. The minute you listen, they feel heard and therefore they feel safe. Then that will help you choose to acknowledge what's going on as opposed to fixing what's going on. And yeah. once you've heard the challenge and you've acknowledged them so they feel safe and heard, then you can go into your response, the action that you're going to take. You choose to respond. You can either just sit with them and say, wow, that must be really hard for you, or ask them, do you want to talk more about it, or should we go for a walk? But you get to choose how you respond to that. Otherwise, you could either be the responder or the persecutor. Either way, you're in drama or you're out of drama. And that's entirely up to you as a parent. Now, that takes time to develop. That takes effort. That takes work. Most parents think, I don't have the time to do that. I don't have the time to to change the way I respond to my kids or respond to my challenges. And that's your choice. You're choosing suffering. Well, that, yes. And that, you know, just even going back to my comments at the beginning of the show about relationships, so often feel people, I I don't have time to spend on, on, especially as a parent, to, to do these things that are so consequential in terms of building right. that trust. You know, when I think authenticity, we talk a lot on the show about do-overs and as parents saying, I'm sorry, and as parents being vulnerable and right. wow, I have, I feel like I'm, I'm, I've gotten so much better at that and how much how? better my relationship is with my kids. Sorry. How have you become better at it? By practicing it. I mean, by, you know, a lot of what you're saying, I, I describe that as, you know, with my kids, with my husband, meeting them where they are. Um, and I, I agree with the listening. And I know I have to be in the right space because I have listened with gritted teeth. <laughs> I don't know what you call that hearing. Right. And so I have really. Resentment. Pra- yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like none seething, of that over here. <laughs> seething, <laughs> listening. Uh, I have, I have become so much better, and it becomes a. I feel like it becomes sort of this virtuous cycle when you do it, and people respond well. And in this case, yeah. the people being Sanjay, Nicholas, or Alex, my kids and husband, and then and then you say to yourself, "Oh, that was really effective." But to me, the biggest thing is the results of it, which is there is so much more harmony 
in our home because we're able to avoid the um, the dis, uh, sort of dysregulation. You know, mm. things get worse. You know, in the past, things would get worse and worse, mm. and then, you know, and fall apart. Now I feel like I'm much better at modeling that. And you know, right. my husband and my kids are too. But we are we are all each other's teachers. I always say, uh, my kids are my Buddhas, so they've taught me a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can give you an, always, a real oh. example of how I've started to try and institute this because I have, as you know, a five-year-old daughter. And we had these two boys that are basically all grown up now that were, they were a handful in a way that's so different than the, my daughter is. And we were at the grocery store yesterday and she wanted a thing and the, she was so tired and so hungry, and she was just melting down and melting down. And I have a, I have a thing in my head where I need to be strong and like, no, no no, we're going home. We're going to eat this. This is what we're doing. And in that moment, I tried to remember that that amps her up more. So instead, like I walked away and I looked at her and I was like, what are you feeling? And I just took my tone down. I took our, I tried to consciously think about taking my energy down and let go of the idea that it's my job to be stern and firm and tell her no boundaries. and not give in. Make those boundaries. When she explained what was happening, she said, I'm so hungry, I can't wait till we get home. And she wanted a slice of pizza. And I went to myself, why am I saying no to that? And at that yeah. moment, I was like, your reason makes sense. I hear you're hungry. This is a nutritious food. Let's go get it. She's like, huh. Like That's I heard awesome. her. This is hey, new work. All right. It seems like it should be obvious, but it's not always obvious, right? We were raised a totally different paradigm as Generation X. Like, our parents were not like that. <laughs> well, and, and yeah, and we're raising, a lot of us uh, are concerned about raising a generation of entitled kids and the idea of being able to help um, Doing them. Doing a good job of it too, by the way. I, I definitely <laughs> A plus all the way on entitled kids. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yikes! Uh, but I I I appreciate that even that small like that really small example, Joanna. That it's like right. these Powerful. big, yeah. That these big things that we're trying to um, institute in our kids' lives, um, discipline, uh, you know, no means no, and all that stuff. But you know, it feels like the wisdom is in saying, you know, back to Lane's point, that that listening and yeah. just. Um, you know, not allowing the drama to bubble up. So step out of this belief and hear what you need. Someone said, do you, you can ask somebody who's in a moment like that, do you want to be hugged, heard, or helped? Mm -hmm. The three H's. And I was like, oh my God, that's so mind-blowing. Yeah. Give the person that, is... that power back. And what Andrea said is just meet them where they are. So the mm -hmm. good thing was that you just decided to meet her where she was as opposed to being where you think you needed to be. The so, podcast yeah. guests are sinking in. I love it. <laughs> we're, we're okay. So so appreciative of that wisdom. Um, but one well, other thing what, I want to add oh, to that. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about your kids being a little Buddhist. I always say that our triggers are our greatest teachers. Exactly. Yes. And if that, but oh, okay. So let's let's drill into that for a moment, because <laughs> what you say, it's like what we fear, we attract, right? Mm -hmm. And when that that trigger happens. It's like we just want to escape. We just mm. want it to go away. We're angry. Mm. We're resentful. And so, yeah, when I think about the idea of the uninvited Buddha saying, what is this enlightened, whether it's our kid, our husband, a condition in our bodies, whatever that thing is that feels like an intruder, yeah. for me, it's been a game changer to say, oh, my God, what are they trying to teach me? You know, and <laughs> trying to not resist the lesson. And so, so talk to me. I mean, what do you have a do you have an uninvited Buddha? Is there, an a, you know, um, a specific either person or experience in your life where you go, oh, okay, that's why that well, kept happening, or that had to happen for me to become free or wiser. Nearly every human being in my life, <laughs> my husband, <laughs> um, my husband, sorry, Kirk, one of my greatest triggers. Yeah, Never Kirk missed. is definitely my one of my greatest triggers. And, mm. uh, and I do a thing called NET, which is neuroemotional technique. And once a week I go Ooh. and address because our bodies uh, emotionally harbor emotional pain, but we physically distract ourselves from the emotional pain. Mm -hmm. So I go and deal with the emotional before I address the physical. Because if you've read any Louise Hay's work, you know, mm -hmm. Louise Hay talks about, you know, the, the metaphysical body. And 
when I go and do these sessions, sometimes we just shortcut it. You know, it's through kinesiology, it's like Kirk, Kirk, Kirk. Oh, honey. <laughs> You're in good company here. Like to have yeah. an amazing partner. We all recognize yeah. we have these amazing partners, but that's the nature of that oh, relationship. They teach us so much. Holy smokes. Yeah. But it's not mm-hmm. it's not them that's that's uh the pain. It's actually the emotional pain that you've harbored from previous experiences. They're just triggering. They're just they're just Are you trying to tell me it. Sanjay's not the problem, it's me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's the last place I want to look. But <laughs> right? I'm not that's serious. the thing. Yeah. yeah. But, we then, but you do give it away at that moment when it's like, it's for sure Sanjay. It's like at that moment you are, you're giving it away. And where yeah. you could keep some of it. And that is empowering once you can reframe it. But that does remind me, Andrea and I were talking. So I asked my husband, Yvonne, who's been your friend for like 30 years. I was like, what would yeah. you ask Lane? on a podcast. (laughs) And he said, you guys need to understand that when Lane started surfing, guys would literally kick her out of the water. They were like, you do not belong here. There were not really other girls she could look up to. There wasn't a mentor. She was going places that people were overtly saying, get out. You're not wanted here. And he's like, I would want to know from her, how do you overcome not just feeling unwelcome, but being overly told, we don't want you here. And not just overcome it, but then like kick ass at it. <laughs> Find your allies. Mm. That's how I overcame it. So for every one of those guys that was trying to kick me out of the water, there was maybe five of them kicking me out. There was one that was helping me stay in. So I was able no, to really. tune into the people that were supportive. My dream team, as opposed to my dream oh, team. The, the uh, courageous ones. Right, just the ones that see more in you than you see in yourself. Totally, oh. yeah. That that said, I mean, finding those allies, which can be, you know, can be tricky. I had a uh, a question right. related to Joanna's on one of your Instagrams. You say I wasn't born a world champion. I wasn't right. born with the ability to right. become one either. So many people have dreams of becoming a professional, and then I okay, and so I. I, I, I'm, I'm like butchering this. I'm like, wait, doesn't this, uh, is, is this more? Is this mine? Why am I, I reading really questions? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to say is so many people have dreams of becoming a professional athlete. Few have the gall yeah. to say, I want to be the world's best yeah. and, and then go for it, especially at a time when, as Joanna said, your sport was entirely host, uh, hostile to women. Yeah. And so for a lot of us, myself included, when I was younger, it would feel pompous and or even foolish to claim to want too much or that I was going to become so much. And so I'm wondering, at what point did you, you know, just summon the chutzpah to say you're going to be the world's best surfer? And, you know, did that happen kind of in time? I would just love because I, I feel like it takes a lot to say I'm going to be the best and to really mean it versus people will say these things with no intention to do it whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say it, but I'll never take the action to get anywhere mm-hmm. closer to it. Mm-hmm. My, when you said in your introduction that I've won five world titles in fear and two in love, I, I think we could uh, relate the, um, draw the correlation between what drove me to become a six times consecutive world champion mm. and then what, where did the desire come from? So I was adopted at birth. And my dad didn't tell me I was adopted till I was eight years of age. And in that moment, it was the catalyst moment that really drove me to want to become a world champion because I felt so worthless, so rejected, so abandoned as an eight-year-old that I felt, I started saying to myself, look, my own mother didn't want me. So whose love am I worthy of? So if I become the best in the world, everyone will love me. And that's Mm -hmm. really what I was striving for. So I wasn't going for the world titles. I was going for self-love. I was going for worthiness. That's really what I was striving for, but I didn't know it until I got there. I went, holy shit, that was a wild ride. One of my friends asked me, what's driving you? Is it because you're adopted? I'm like, yeah, actually, that really resonates. (laughs) Could you have asked me that after the first one, please? Because then I wouldn't have gone into this (laughs) fear state mentality. (laughs) I'd still want to won, no question, but. I started declaring to the world that I was at at 14, I was going to be a multiple time world champion surfer. And so going back to little lane at eight, is there any yeah. chance, and I realize this is all maybe a weird theoretical question, but when I think about, and, and I'm not adopted, so I'm, you know, I, I totally appreciate that. I can't relate to, to this. Um, yeah. But my instant, my instant response is yes, one person for whatever reason 
couldn't mother you, but somebody else chose you. I mean, yeah. How how does that work? It was that something that you eventually came to? Because I also, I mean, I'm mindful there are quite a few adopted people out in the world, and I'm I'm sure that this is a hot button. Like people are listening right now. <laughs> how, how how did you? I mean, just talk about that it, that journey from yeah, it's saying a, I was rejected a, to being chosen. It's a common denominator through all adoptees that we have a massive fear of rejection, which prevents us from trusting in others. It prevents us from reaching out and asking for help. We have to believe we have to do it all on our own and we have to prove something to the world that we're worthy. And that drives us into all sorts of endeavors. It can drive us into alcoholism, drug abuse, um, you know, workaholism. Just it can drive us into It sounds like a lot. I mean, I'm over here going, holy crap, that sounds like me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it can drive us into dysfunction or it can drive us towards success. And you'll look at some of the most successful people in the world are also adoptees. So- it all depends how you choose to view it and your perspective of it and then what you choose to channel your attention into. I always had this belief that I was rejected, not accepted. And if I, if you've ever said, Steve, Steve, um, oh my God, Jobs was an adoptee. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah, totally. So if you, if you think about some of the most successful people in the world, yes, we've had our, we've all had our challenges. We've all overcome that it- some shit. But it all determines, it's all determined by how you identify with it. Now, I was fiercely driven to become the best in the world because I had decided success was defined by becoming the most successful surfer in history. And if I didn't achieve success, then I wasn't going to be worthy of love. Mm -hmm. So I I didn't realize how much of my self-worth and identity was wrapped up in those achievements. So that made the roller coaster ride really intense. So when I was succeeding, I felt really good. But when I was not, when I was failing, I was a failure. So the difference was yes. when I was when I was winning, I was just on top of the world. But when I was losing, I was an epic, dismal, disappointed, depressed failure. And then when I was in my love based world titles, which were process driven, when I was winning, yeah, I was happy. But when I was losing, I was learning. And that really helped me make a, mm. a different. Uh, thank you, my darling. My husband just brought me my daily smoothie. Oh, thank we you. love you. Oh, he can't hear <laughs> we us. We love but... you. He can feel our vibes. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. I, so speak, I, I wasn't going to ask about Kirk quite yet, but you've made a, a great opening between the smoothie. I wish I could reach right through and uh, take yummy. a little sip. Um, <laughs> and then rejected, not accepted, because yes, from what I've read, you have the dreamiest marriage ever. Um, <laughs> two loving, mature adults uh, who adore <laughs> each other. You guys have we been did. together for a long time. 21 um, years. Yeah, I mean, and so he chose you, right? So there's just something really exquisite to me in recognizing the hurt and heartache and the rejection and how you how you uh, sought to overcome that. And here you are as a superstar athlete that is now with somebody that adores you. I mean, I just want to like, woo, like Brian, can we cue some, uh, like the, the whole uh, whole crowd, uh, whole uh, um, in-studio crowd I know wants to clap. There we go, oh, yeah. took a second. <laughs> um, but I have to ask, because for those of you who aren't familiar, um, uh, Lane's husband is Kirk. I want to make sure I pronounce his name. Uh, Pengli? Pengili? Pengili. Pengili. Okay. Um, who uh, is part of NXS. So were you a big NXS fan before you guys Massive. met? Massive. the truth. Massive. Massive okay, fan. thank God. I was going to be like, that is lost on you then as an <laughs> NXS super fan. Um, yeah. What's, what's your favorite? concert I ever went to. Was it? Yeah, that's so cool. That's very I know. romantic. And we we often talk, we often joke about the fact that there's Kirk standing on the stage, you know, in his red suit, blowing his saxophone, and there I am. But like, I think I was about fourteen in the audience <laughs> in my Garfield jumper. Out. Oh my! And yeah, we, you know, we joke like, "There's my future wife," you know. Like. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> that is so if you're cool. married to someone older, you can never do that. It's like it's no. so like because Yvonne is twelve years older than me. So he'll be like, man, yeah, and then I graduated from college, and it's like I was in middle school. It's like you just can't. <laughs> yeah, but that's it's so awesome. cute that you you just can't. It does show you that like little freeze frame of like you don't know where your life's going. Yeah, oh no yeah, idea. being and we were set open. up on a blind date too. So Kirk didn't really choose me; it was kind of made for him. <laughs> but he chose to stay. <laughs> well, okay. So talk about that because I I just got a huge chuckle that uh, you were like, yeah, no, this this guy's. Mm-mm. Yeah, <laughs> which I think is so funny. 
Yeah, I really had no, we, there was no chemistry, there was no connection. We really had no interest in each other. We were both there, both at this date due to obligation. Now, the guy called John Stevens, who was the front man of Noise Works, which is a Kiwi band and then became the oh, front cool. man of Excess, he uh-huh. set us up on a blind date. Now, I'd broken up with my previous partner, a guy called Ken Bradshaw, who Yvonne knows very well. And uh, he was a big wave surfer who lived in Hawaii. So I lived in Hawaii for about five years. And then Ke- uh, Kirk had just broken up recently with his longtime partner who he'd been with for like seven years. So we were both kind of on the rebound. Kirk was just finding his feet again. I came home from Europe and uh, I went up to John's place to, to get some tickets to a, a private in excess show that they were doing. And uh, he's like, so how's it going? I said, oh, I've just broken up with Cam. He's like, yes, excellent. <laughs> Bang. All right. I got the man for you. I'm like, okay, that was quick. <laughs> Thanks. And he set us up. Uh, or I went to this show. He wanted me to meet Kirk and get his number from him and take him on a date. So long story short, I finally do get to get Kirk's number and it wasn't without its challenges. A week later, I rang him and said, I'd love to take you out on a date. Come to my house in Curl Curl. He lived in Potts Point, which is like 40 minutes away in the city. He showed up at my house. He had this Hawaiian shirt. He was actually probably 12 to 14 kilos heavier than what he is now. So he was carrying excess weight. He was quite pasty white. And, uh, you know, this balding <laughs> rock star. And I'm Sounds like, hot. yeah, this not, yeah, not, <laughs> it's not going on was, at all. <laughs> when I was at the show, when I was at the private gig, I was looking at John and Kirk. I'm like, John, you're hot. Kirk, you're sitting up. But okay. Oh my God. I'll, brutal. I'll, I'll do, I'll go with it. Anyway, Kirk showed up and I took him 10 pin bowling at our local RSL <laughs> and that local pub. And then I walked him down to my favorite, one of my favorite restaurants in DY and He's talking about surfing all the way. I'm like, this is so boring. And then we're at the oh. restaurant and we're literally yawning in each other's face. And we're like, oh, so I, oh. so I went into the bathroom thinking if there's a window big enough to climb out of, I'm out of here. <laughs> oh, oh my God. Can you imagine? How funny is that? And oh Kirk's thinking, she's been a while. If I do leave money on the table and do a run out, do you think she'll care? Probably not. It's okay. <laughs> but, yeah. And then he realized that his car was at my house. He didn't remember where I parked. So, I mean, where oh, okay. I lived. And so he ended up staying. I came out of the bathroom going, oh, still here. Oh, well, I have to do dress with that. And then um, he, I think the owner of the restaurant realized that the two of us weren't really getting along and he sat down with a fresh bottle of limoncello and that got the party started. And so we've been together oh ever my since gosh. eight Limoncella years Limoncello for the win. We toasted Amazing. at our wedding with limoncello and oh. it's been um, a blissful marriage without, well, with a plenty of challenges and road bumps along the way, but that's the rela- nature of relationship. That's so. life. Yeah. And, and yeah. life. All right. Well, so what's yeah. your favorite in excess song? Do you have number one, number it's one, number very, two? It's a very random one. It's a unique one called Johnson's Airplane. That's my <laughs> okay. favorite one. The second one is Don't Change. That's my number one. That, yeah. And then the last one is Need You Tonight. Mm. Dun, that's the big dun, hit. Dun, dun. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the big hit. Um, Lane, we have kind of a funny thing that we like to do. Sometimes mm-hmm. when we have like a true expert in a specialized field where we want to just ask you advice for someone who asked a question on Reddit. And this right. one, and that, and I'll just read it quick. And um, Andrea, should I do the controversial one since it's only 20 minutes or should I do the sweet one? Do the sweet one, and then uh, okay. I, think we got time. I think we can get to both. We got time for both. Okay, okay. So this is surf as a middle-sized girl. Can you guys still see me? I just navigated away. What's a middle-sized girl? Yeah, this is part of the question. So it says, I want, <laughs> and, and this this gal's name on Reddit is Public Lifeguard. Um, Public Lifeguard, And she okay. says, I want to and surf, can- but I'm quite scared to start surfing because I don't have the typical body for surfing. Can middle size slash fat people also surf or will they get judged? I've been loving to surf since I was about 12, but I never had the courage to start. Now that I have more confidence, I'd like to start surfing. I'm 17, but I'm scared for my body right now. I have a good condition and I'm fit. I play ice hockey and I'd love to know your opinions. So I feel like we should go straight to the source and ask Lane Beachley. What do you think? Should the 17 year old girl start surfing? My first question is, why does she judge herself so harshly? Yeah. I just don't understand why she feels that she doesn't have the typical body because there is no typical body for there surfing. Isn't, yeah. And we become what we judge. So that what that means is if you think you're fat and you think you're not typical and 
then you'll look for people who represent that and judge them. And what you say yeah. to them is a reflection of how you feel about yourself. So just accept who you are, accept the body that you have and recognize that the body is amazing, but it's also a reflection of how you feed it and how you move it. So if you're unhappy with it, change the way you feed it or move it and accept mm -hmm. that you have that element of control over how your body looks and feels. Now, be consistent and change the self-talk for a start. You need to ch yeah. change your relationship with yourself because that sets the tone for every other relationship. People are going to say what they want to say and that says more about them than it does about you. As a professional surfer who was winning consistently, my peers fucking hated me. I was always in their way. It was always my fault. I stole their world titles. Quite honestly, the target that I had on my back when I was walking towards the beach or towards the contest area in my contest jersey, I turned that target into a mirror and said, take right. a look at yourselves. That's your shit. That's your yeah. stuff. That's your narrative. It's not mine. Because I had to have the, the wearable to just go, okay, the relationship that I have with me is more important. So surf size is surfer it's got nothing to do with the size of your body or having a typical body it comes down to your mind and your relationship so stop judging yourself start loving yourself and loving your body and being in awe of how amazing our bodies are what they do naturally what they do automatically what they enable us to do in life it's pretty remarkable but at a 17 year old yeah it's a tough time because you're being distracted and persuaded by external circumstances to tell you that no matter how you look or what you do or where you live or what you own, it's never enough, no matter yeah. what you do. That, that's that never thing. enough, I just want to say a big amen and cap that because that I feel like back to the um, just that, that mentality from whether it's the addiction mentality or um, uh, looking for um, external validation right? It's yeah. like you can't ever get enough external validation. Like you just can. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you can't drink enough tequila shots, <laughs> you know, to find no. yourself. Yeah. And so, so I just love that. Okay. Uh, Joanna, Here's what's the next one? the second one. Okay. Okay. It's just loading. Okay. <clears throat> the question is, am I the a-hole for telling the truth to our daughter about what is and isn't for girls? <laughs> Hi, all. <laughs> my wife and me have one daughter freya she's five and a lovely kid when she was born she decided when she was born we decided that we wouldn't go full gender neutral but we wouldn't push her into being more traditionally feminine or masculine as it stands freya has a variety of interests she loves playing football outside with me and i've taught her some light boxing she also has an entirely pink room and loves trying on dresses and playing with makeup. We do our best to avoid saying that certain things are for boys or girls and just want her to do her thing. Obviously, she's a bright kid and inevitably now she's asking questions about what she sees for herself. I was watching a match and Freya asked if football was meant for boys because we always see men playing it on TV and at her school only boys play. I hesitated, but in the end said, yes, football is mostly played by boys. Freya asked if that was bad that she likes playing, but I said she could play if she wants. Now my wife is really unhappy with me because we'd always agreed that we wouldn't give her traditional upbringing. I agree with her, but we also can't treat our daughter like an idiot. She's noticed this, and if we lie, she'll know we're lying to her. I'm perfectly happy for her to be whatever she wants, but I also want to treat her with respect and not sugarcoat things, which will ultimately make things worse. Am I the a-hole? This one's a little bit complicated. Oh, well, first thing is what's traditional male and female is just a societal construct. Second thing is kids learn from what they see more so than what they're told. So you can tell your daughter she can do anything, but if all she sees is men playing the sport that she loves, then she'll believe that only men can play that. We can't be it unless we can see it, which is why the World Cup of Soccer has been such a monumental shift in the world of, of football around yeah. the world. Because women are like, oh, I can do that too. <laughs> Amazing. Thirdly, lying to your children protects you. It doesn't protect them. Mm, yeah. That's so Love true. That. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's like we have to balance 
um, so we have a son who has a pretty serious stutter and he's, he's gotten a lot better with speech therapy, but it was like, I remember him saying, am I going to stutter forever? And the fact is he's going to stutter forever. It's something that's going to is stick he? with him. Uh, that's the theory. Um, that's what the, the, like the best speech language therapists say, yeah, it's a thing you always have. The trick is instead of fighting it, you go with it. And so we yeah. said- this is part of how you talk. Everyone talks differently and you can do the work. Um, and then you surround yourself by people who think that you're unique and interesting and your stutter is part of that. And that acceptance is what's what slowed him down. But what if I'd lied to him and said, all the doctors say you'll be done with it by the time you're 18. That's yeah. way worse. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, he could have decided, okay, I'm going to be done with it when I'm 18 and then just stop stuttering. Yeah. I'm just yeah, well, wondering. A... I have, have you seen this book called... Metaphysical anatomy? No. No, cool it's cover. fascinating. So I'm just bringing up stuttering to Ooh. see what it means. Oh my gosh, how interesting. It's yes. really interesting. It, we could have a whole conversation about it, but like it's one of those things that like panic attacks, the more you think about it, worry about it, and feel anxious about it, the more mm. it shows up. Yeah, well, and that's so what Elaine like, said. What we fear, we attract. What yeah. we focus on expands. Yeah. So stuttering, the emotional component of it is that you're fearful of expressing your honest opinion. You don't want to voice your needs. Your problems are magnified when you're around people who are very vocal in conversation. You may feel forced to communicate in a way that doesn't resonate with you. You're often sensitive. Um, you're often sensitive. Hang on. You are often sensitive people in a harsh family. Harsh communication may have been projected at you while you expressed yourself. Why well, I refer to harsh communication, bear in mind that what is harsh to you may not be harsh to someone else, so keep an open mind. You experienced mm -hmm. trauma when you communicated, which resulted in a fight, a flee, or freeze response. Now when you communicate, it automatically triggers the old childhood trauma and the results in the gut instinct have been activated. This will have a direct impact on how fluently you communicate to others. So this is amazing. Is oh my God. Yeah, Congrats. so big breakthrough. You, wow. Is it, well, you feel intense emotions when you communicate. Trauma you experienced may also be unrelated to communication. The feelings of anger, resentment, and a need to run or hide come to the surface when you communicate, leaving you vulnerable and open to attack. As a result, you disassociate. Yeah, disassociate when you communicate. It begs the question: What are you disassociating from? You've experienced a trauma during the infancy stages. Crying as a baby may have resulted in punishment. This will be a mm. shock to any newborn baby who does not understand the reaction from their caretaker. This may result in an unconscious association. Expressing myself equals attack and feeling in shock. The emotional components related to this condition should be explored in the ancestry line along with toxic poisoning. Toxic poisoning could affect the muscles in the body, affect movement and speech. The emotional strain was already present in the ancestor's life before possible toxic components came into play. The predisposition for stuttering was already present during cell division. Oh, <laughs> like so wow. So like almost like epigenetics, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it sounds like, I mean, and that's the thing. I feel like when you think about generational trauma, right, which yeah. we talk a lot about um, on the show, how much is handed down and, you know, like epigenetics, what ends up getting expressed, right? I mean, it can just, it that can feel pretty, uh, pretty scary, but it can also be so empowering to say, oh, okay, now we can do something with it because they, they couldn't in the past. Yeah, because you have a fear of provoking a reaction from an influential person that caused you stress in the past. So there's yeah. a bunch of questions that you can ask. Um, oh, my gosh. I'll, I'll take we a photo to... of it and send it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, so interesting. And, and one interesting thing that happens is, so he had, was like missing all these sounds and so no one understood him when he was little. Yeah, and that's yeah, what's resonating. Yeah. Obviously, Yvonne and I never yelled at him for crying or anything. That's not <laughs> who we are. But people would be like, we don't know what you're saying. Mm. And so that seems right because then all of a sudden he's trying to express himself and he's getting what feels like negativity. <laughs> Feeling oh. like he's attacked. And he's like, just yeah. a boy. Stand you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's being I'm getting this so book. Now. Oh my gosh. I am getting. Well, Andrea, book, that book. We're getting that book that we're going to do. Yeah. Uh, Yvette Rose, Yvette Rose, anatomy. we want you on our Yvette show. Rose. Well, it also yes. reminds me a little bit of Louise Hayes' work too, yes. right? Very, very similar. So that, I mean, that's such, that's awesome. Thank you, Lane, for, I mean, just big, big time. Boom. I, yeah. I appreciate it. And, you know, our son has something called, and, and don't read it. We'll, 
I feel like we only have a few more <laughs> what minutes. Is it? What is it? Let me answer uh, right, yeah, it. <laughs> it's called EOE, eosinophilic esophagitis, which is becoming more and more common. Oh my gosh, I've heard of that. Yeah, no, it's becoming more and more common. And I, my conjecture is some, between our the food that we're, we're eating, GMO, um, weed, and so forth in America, probably not so much in Australia, and, right, right. and probably... Um, projected stress and so forth. Like I am convinced it's like an inflammatory response in his body. So without going more and more into it, when I think about these chronic illnesses, it fascinates me to think about or, or you know, conditions or so forth to think, okay, let's really get curious and look at the root cause. Back to the uninvited yes. Buddha, right? Rather yeah. than saying, I'm going to resent it. I'm going to reject it. I'm going to be mad yeah. as hell at it. It's like, oh shit, what does this have to teach me? Or I'm going to look for a silver bullet or some sort of some sort of pill Something. we can take. Some right. Sort of treatment. Numb, yeah. Numb it, numb it. Numb it. Tequila. Medicated. Just getting more tequila. <laughs> <laughs> Taking on more and more work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Squash it down. Squash That's it right. down. Well, my um, last little question for Lane might be, how does it feel now after everything that you've gone through and struggled to change surfing to be more inclusive of women? I just, my daughter got this book about Sarah Gerhardt surfing oh. at Mavericks. Is this so oh, cute? Someone true. gave it to her just randomly. That's and epic. Yeah. Like, think about, like, how different it is for my daughter compared to when you were young. How do you feel when you, is there any sense of like, oh, I would have liked that? Or is it no, just not at all. joy? I feel, I feel 100% resolved and satisfied because yeah. I hate to see all the battles that I enjoy that the boardroom and at the beach amount to nothing and the status quo just remain the same. So to see pay equity on the pro tour, to see more girls picking up a surfboard than boys, to see dads and brothers and uncles and you know men encouraging their young girls to get into surfing and their wives to get into surfing, that fills me with a sense of, oh, just immense satisfaction. It gives me warm fuzzies. You know, I'm just so grateful that the, that the, that the sport has changed and evolved and embraced women because well, uh, we hold up half the sky. Well, congratulations and thank you for being so so courageous and fierce. It's it watching you serve is hypnotizing. It is like no, thank that you. is so cool. Like it is so it is. cool. So uh, it so is very if anybody's cool. yeah, just like oh, like I, I want to see the superstar champion. Um, you can find Lane Beachley on her Instagram. My last question for you, as yes. a world champion athlete, is there a another uh, superstar athlete that you admire most, or you know, a, a couple? And if so, have you have you told him or her or them? Hmm. Who do I admire most? <laughs> I've or if every, there's a surfer you love watching right now, so, no, uh, in, every in particular. Human- Every human being that I meet, that I, that I have profound admiration or respect for, I let them know. Mm. It doesn't just have to be a superstar mm-hmm. because it's nice to be validated. You know, I don't right. seek it, but it's certainly nice to experience it because it just, it's reassuring, it's reaffirming, it's heartwarming. So, uh, but I've met some incredible athletes in my time that I have just the utmost love and respect and admiration for people like Kathy Freeman, for example. Um, I just think it's just one of the most remarkable athletes. I think Kelly Slater is an incredible athlete. Uh, and I was very fortunate to to compete alongside him and learn from him and mm-hmm. challenge him. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you wish you were still out there looking at how he's still out there? No, God, no, no. I've got better things to Not do come in my and be life. Out <laughs> <against> <laughs> what about this is... Uh, against- this, this, is this, is oh, this is the podcast. Alex, meet hey, uh, Lane. Uh, please Alex. Ship. If anyone's wondering, nerds, go get your skin in at Walmart or Costco if you want to get them. Okay, beat a child. Thanks. I love you. Welcome, you, Alex. We're getting that nerds Enjoy money. That sugar. Yeah, yeah, we're getting um, that nerds yeah. money. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Uh, um, uninvited no, Buddhas. No, I, yeah, <laughs> uninvited Buddhas in the form of children. Yep. Sugar <laughs> children. Um, I'm sorry, Lane. Go ahead, please. Some other athletes that I just, you know, I've I've taught Nat Martina and Red Lover how to surf. Oh no! Um, way. How cool yeah. is that? Yeah, I think she's an I incredible athlete. And Yvonne Goulagon, I've had you know interactions with her. Oh yeah, it's just, just I just look. I don't have heroes. I don't have idols you know, because by doing so, you're elevating someone above you, and we're sure, all human yeah. beings. So I just have yeah people that I respect and admire, and then I draw inspiration from. 
And yeah, well, totally. I've met a lot of them. And that's, I mean, when I think about, you know, for me, not not so much athletes, but when I think about other entrepreneurs or, or others that are at the top of their game, where yeah. it's just such a, par- partly it's a permission thing, right? You're, and I love, if you're uh, not familiar with Marianne Williamson, her famous quote, how she, you know, she talks about when we shine our brightest, we essentially give others to do so to do the same. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I figured you'd be familiar. And I just, when I think about when we're, uh, we have the occasion, whether we know them or, or we observe them from afar, those people that help us see more of our, like on the positive way, where we can achieve our full potential, right? It just, it's like we all need teachers. And I feel like the older I get, the more attuned I am to, ooh, that person could be this extraordinary teacher to me, right? And, and we know there's the ugly opposite too, but I, you know, we're, we're here to find the good teachers. Life is a teacher. Life is a teacher. Okay, let's uh, wrap on that. I feel like good little last uh, kernel of wisdom. Lane, you <laughs> are amazing. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being on our show. This was, I feel Pleasure. like I've got a whole page of notes. Um, <laughs> and for uh, folks that want to find um, more about Elaine, um, Elaine, excuse me, Beachley, what is, is this- your, uh, what's your, just Lane Beachley, L-A-Y-N-E, or what, I feel like yep. I should know Lane this. Lane Beachley, L-A-Y-N-E, B-E-A-C-H-L-E-Y. Yes, Beachley is in Beach is my last name. Uh, awakeacademy.com.au and then lanebeachley.com. They're the three places that you'll be able to find me, Instagram and two websites. And the, just and- a shout out for Awake Academy. There are some great courses. They're not expensive. And I, mm-hmm. I felt myself so energized and excited and refreshed and spending time on your site, Lane, and Thank just you. recognizing that, that you've created something that, that can help people, you know, back to the teaching learn what you've learned in a majorly compressed amount of time which is a gift yeah yes i'm a i'm a helper not a healer i like to help people <laughs> oh. help themselves i like that <laughs> all right thanks so much lane okay. really appreciate you coming on the show thank you Pleasure. thank you girl oh my gosh what a badass huh? oh my god was she's so, so cool so good <laughs> i mean just so like wow just cool like superstar athlete rock and roll um, husband, you know, like just what a what a cool combo. And I just love how um, just open and real and down to earth she is. She's amazing. Thank you. And she her. was so open to hearing us mm-hmm. and just giving us feedback too, which mm-hmm. was like amazing. Yeah, we'll take it. Come back, yeah. Lane. We want you back Listen. on our show. Um, <laughs> okay, so Brian, what is your number one actionable takeaway that you are going to do in your life? Starting today, thanks to our own Lane Beachley. I mean, the 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 biggest thing is obviously going to be like something we've kind of talked about a lot. But I love the way she put like our greatest triggers are our greatest teachers. Like that's such a I don't know. It's it's very nice, especially when people talk about oh getting triggered or whatever. And Mm -hmm. it's like no no no. Like those those little responses teach us so much about ourselves and and everything. I don't know. I. Just a quick little bite, but I, I I love that quote. I definitely wrote it down. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm gonna jump in with mine. We become what we judge, and I feel like there have been mm. little kind of um, bits of my uh, peripheral vision or peripheral thinking when I'm annoyed with Sanjay, where it's like, well, you know, he's not paying better attention or he's getting dysregulated, and there's that that part of me, if I'm being really honest with myself, that's like, Andrew. That's what you're doing, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. So we become what we judge, right? And so I just feel like it's such an important reminder, um, you know, and and such an opportunity to be humble and go and, and, and curious, like, okay, that thing that's really pissing me off and feeling so hurtful, let me get really curious about that, the thing that somebody else does that is is more reflective of me and it's just painful to tell the truth about why it, it feed back, you know, it's kind of that, that twin aspect, what you were saying, Brian, too, that, that it's like that trigger thing. So just a little, little okay. different variation of, of that. We become what we judge. So okay. my favorite yeah. part, and it's such a good visual, is like you, you manifest what you're afraid of and what you think of. So if you're afraid of sharks, you're going to start seeing sharks. And it made <laughs> me think about these like zoomed out aerial footage of people who are on stand up paddle boards and there have been sharks under them the whole time and they didn't know mm, and they visual. just I love coexisted. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So like I thought, 
you know, you're afraid of sharks, you're going to start seeing sharks. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yes. what we fear we attract is mm-hmm. big time. I mean, every now and then I start thinking about car accidents and I'm like, Andrea, quit thinking about car accidents. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah, will it into existence. Don't, yeah. don't do that. Let, yeah. that. let that thought pass right on by. Well, she's amazing. She's a guru. And um, Joanna, she and Andy Vaughn, uh, thank you for bringing her into um, our lives and the uh, open relationship family. So. Oh, All right, let's, I'm so glad we had her. Yeah, no totally. Day. All right, let's wrap up. Uh, thanks for listening or listening to or watching our show. We are so grateful to be able to bring this incredible show and these incredible guests to you. We are so passionate about transforming together, and that's the only way it happens. None of us achieves our full potential alone. It just doesn't happen. So thanks for listening and watching. Please Uh, Let us know what you think about the show, pros and cons. We want to hear it all. Openrelationships at yourtango.com is our email address. We welcome your comments um, in the comment sections. You can find us on Spotify, uh, Audible, Apple, uh, a little bit of iTunes. iHeart. iHeart. Yes, one more. And um, and if you really dig us, please share uh, your favorite episodes with your friends and keep uh, keep listening. We're going to be back next week with another amazing episode. And Thanks that's so it. much. Bye, everybody. Bye.